Tube, what up, what up? Looks like the earners in here. What's going on, everybody? Hope everybody's having a good week. We are ending out our run in Los Angeles. It's been a great, great, great run for us. Hold on, hold on. What? We got nobody in attendance. Something's not right. Um, probably what John just sent us. Could be why. Hold on. Yes, so um, we are on a, a great run right now. Um, we have so many legendary episodes that we have in the can that we um, have done over the course of this week. Um, so yeah, man, just looking forward to it. Looking forward to putting it out, releasing it, and getting it out man, in the world. Man, you guys, you guys definitely been on a legendary blessing. run, man. Yo, how do you, how does that feel, bro? Come on now. Like it's it's all it's building up, but the momentum keeps going. How are you guys feeling about that? It's, it's all good, bro. All works. No, so. but put me in that headspace for real. It's like that's insane because you know it's coming together. Like, is it just a blur, or you guys? I mean, you guys just staying on it day by day, or do you get a chance to even look out like a month out? Like, what's what's that mindset like? Now you know what, bro. Um, you know you don't really even get a chance to really think about it too much um right. when, you, when you when you're actually in it and um that's what we you know we just try to just keep our heads down and just keep working so um mm -hmm. you know it's but it's, it's dope man it's dope to just be out here and just really just like you said it just feels like the momentum is just building and building and building it's just getting stronger and stronger every day day by day so um you know what's cool too is like i bet you i bet you the type of deal flow that you guys are seeing is also getting crazy right because um I would imagine, you know, you guys have an immediate platform. So interesting because media is cross sector, right? Like you can, you can amplify any industry with media because you got the people behind you. So in that sense, I can't help but to think of all the different, you know, and of course there's prioritization. Like there's only so many things, you know, that can be done at a time, but um, from NFT, you know, to all kinds of plays, man, it's there. It's there. I'm excited for you guys. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Greatly like, appreciate like, it, my brother. Likewise, man. I know you're building a billion dollar company. So appreciate oh, you. Yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> we're focused, man. We're focused. Uh, and on that note, um, welcoming folks into the season finale of the Wealth Principles. This uh, has been an experiment, uh, a giant experiment. You know, like, let me riff um, openly here. So, an experiment because is what we have is oh, oh, one second, Mandy. Check, check, okay, cool. Um, what we have is any anyone that has a product has to figure out different ways that they can bring it out to the market. And one of the efficiencies that you can deploy if you know how to create media is to build your own organic media. But see, here's the thing, that that shit takes time. It should take and there's a long tail and off the time, you just have more immediate pressures. So what do folks resort to when they have that immediate pressure? Well, a lot of times they'll get sold by an agency. They might try some ads and that shit is cool. But the moment you stop spending, it goes away, <laughs> right? So ironically, the shit that's harder to build is also the shit that is, or perhaps not surprisingly, um, shit that's hard to build is, is also harder for it to go away. You can liken that to a stock portfolio. Uh, I'm sure the trapper would agree. Um, the, the stocks that have less volatility, you build a bigger base of those and it's yielding, you know, uh, dividends. And, you know, the goal, of course, from a wealth perspective is to get to the point where you have enough principal invested. You got $5 million and you're earning, you know, 3% off of that. Then you're making an annual salary and you make 150 grand. You don't even have to touch your principal. And then the principal can continue growing. 
But now what's interesting is my journey with this idea of building wealth has really evolved and has been fluid. Um, at some point I was over indexed on stocks. Yo, I'm gonna go hard at stocks. I discover private investments. Okay, cool, man. I like real estate, a little cash flow, yada, yada. Um, but at some point you got to lean into your strengths. And what I figured out is I'm a fucking, like, I like making shit. And when you make some shit, you can sell it too. And this is a whole way of wealth as well, where you can create a company that just rises in tremendous value. And, and then you can create a liquidity event, much like Rich Hollywood with Dennis from Shea Moisture, who sold sundial brains he built that shit out the mud bootstrap selling in harlem in the 90s uh and he had a billion dollar exit um and then he was able to invest in others and create a fund and so on so a lot of paths is the point a lot of paths are you want to hold down a job and you want to invest in stocks and grow your portfolio patiently over time you you will get rich as well um do you want to go all the fuck in on one particular idea and not like not deviate until you pop off as an artist, for example? That's also a path. And guess what? A lot of these motherfuckers in corporate don't make half as much money as a lot of these rappers. Mm -hmm. Now, but there is a tier that make a lot more than rappers. Uh, and of course you wouldn't know because you know the way they dress or whatever, but still I find entertainment an incredibly viable path um to to generate a mad money because when you when your image and likeness becomes valuable the music is but a platform to to preserve and maintain your um your reach and your relevance in the culture when i was on television my deal flow skyrocketed not because of me i was just a messenger but i was on vice lands airwaves and so a lot of brands and a lot of speaking deals and a lot of opportunities was coming my way. During that time, I probably made three, three, 400 grand just in speaking. I only got paid 30 grand for the show, but the speaking volume elevated. So you can go that way. I think that's very viable. Um, and so anyways, a lot of ways to skin it. Um, I love the way you guys are going about it personally. I, I think Earn Your Leisure is actually very, it's a, see i never thought about it from like you know like we're boys so like it's like yo it's my homies they're popping off but now if i would have just put on like my my investor hat and say wow this is an interesting this is an interesting deal <laughs> right because <laughs> because what you guys have created in terms of the value are owned properties you guys have your main show is owned it was cultivated and grown over time so it's not over-reliant on any one partnership or distribution channel. It's owned. But in addition to that, right, I know as I'm practicing now at Loop and looking to penetrate audiences, and I realize, wow, uh, earn your leisure effectively as a result of the guests that you guys have interviewed in an authentic fashion have become the aggregation of the category that is urban economic empowerment, right? Which that's what you can call it what you want but it's in the cultural zeitgeist it's in the zeitgeist and eyl has become zeitgeist. aggregation a, john's bringing out the dictionary today the zeit, you, zeitgeist. you have pulled out all the most interesting relevant people in the steam and have a nurtured your own audience but b all you while you were at it have brought in collective audiences so now um that, that's uh, very valuable. From that can come IP. From that can come IP. You can uh, start creating, if you wanted, fictional shows. This might be an interesting play. I would bring on a fucking illustrator and create, you know, tips about building wealth in kids' story hey, format. Top, everything top secret, John. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> right. Boom. And then, yeah, that's IP. You can create uh, assets that become licensable. And, you know, in the form uh, of books and so on, NFTs, of course, whatever. I get excited about any and all things business. That's why on today's episode, we are going to do straight Q&A. We got like 50 questions. Ooh. Some are trash. Some are heat. <laughs> um, and I figure we just go through them uh, and just riff on the ones that are the most fun, the, the ones that catch our attention. 
All right. You want to you stop? I'll, I'll, I'll read off the first one. How's that? Yes, sir. And Let's just and feel free. If you think it's whack, you just feel free and look through. There's a lot that are yeah, just- Yeah, I'm going to comb through them. I'm going to comb through them, man. And right. then we can kind of mix it up with throwing some Zoom questions. Yeah, so we got this, I, I see our earners are coming yeah, actually, in here that would, now. For yeah. sure. Like, Raise your hundred percent. I would prefer the Zoom questions, but we always we also have these that we could. Yeah, yeah, not for sure. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. So, uh, top of the list says: Is outside funding absolutely necessary to scale? Man, did you guys take in any bread when you start earning your leisure? Absolutely not. Zero. Come on, absolutely man. Not. Now, now, how many bozo ass media companies out there? No disrespect, but how many bozo ass media companies done raise a ton of money? and tried all these five things that you should do to, you know, they came out with a listicles. That's what they call them. And they generated prop up traffic, fake traffic, <laughs> uh, real traffic, but like fake in the sense that it goes away. Um, and, and yet you guys with no bread came at it, how you came at it. Um, so, you know, you guys, you guys tell me. I would say, no, you definitely don't need that. Um, it depending on what kind of business you, 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 if you have like a, you know, a shipping company that's a lot of overhead and you don't have any money. Um, but me personally, I don't think that those are the best kind of businesses to start right now in today's economy. I think online businesses are probably the most practical um, mm -hmm. and the most profitable in a lot of cases. And uh, that's something that we did, you know, our business is an online business and uh, there is extremely low overhead. So mm -hmm. it's something that requires a lot of time mm -hmm. and it's something that does require a skill set. Like even editing videos and things of that nature. If you if you don't know how to do it yourself, then you would have to, you know, hire somebody to do that, or you know, make a deal with somebody where you can give them equity in your company um, if they perform a service that you might not be able to pay them for upfront. So that's always that's always a, a um, something as well that you can do. It doesn't necessarily have to be paying somebody. If if you really think that they're that valuable, they, you can give them equity if they believe in a company and they'll work for free because mm -hmm. they know that the payout on the back end is going to be much more than, you know, a couple hundred dollars or a thousand dollars that you're going to pay them for their services up front. So um, absolutely not. But like I said, obviously it just depends on what kind of property, what kind of business you're starting. But for us, our personal experience in starting our business, um, we, uh, yeah, yeah, used our own money, which was very little. We didn't even have to spend that much money because it's a, it's a low cost operation, especially at the beginning stages. And then mm -hmm. we just, reinvested the money that's important More reinvest money, yeah. reinvest the the money that you make invest in infrastructure keep growing it and take it from there yeah i think your best currency the number one currency when you when you're trying to scale is going to be value right so if you add value even when you're trying to find somebody that to, to that can help you scale if they see value in it if they believe in it the belief will come from the value that you're adding and so mm -hmm. Think of that first. What value am I adding? And then figure out what you need. Because you might not need anything, right? You can start where you are. I always say that. Start where you are, do what you can, and let's see where you can go. Um, so yeah, the value add is the most important thing, I think, in scaling, right? We, we had a platform. We added value with information. People came. Things came after that. Um, but the number one thing was like, let's do something that is disruptive. Let's do something that is valuable to not only our community, but the world. And the benefits will come after. All money in, that was our model. All money in, stay down till you come up. <laughs> all, all money in, no money out. That's it. Easier said than done, but I concur. <laughs> I, I concur. Um, I think outside funding, not, not necessary to get started. Um, not necessary, but um, it's interesting because, we, yeah, such a small percentage of businesses do get it. And one thing that I've noticed is like, man, this record way you know i'm not sure how much how much you guys have covered SPACs uh, on eyl uh, but a SPAC is a special purpose uh acquisition company um that effectively has gamified the ipo the the illustrious elusive There is mad scrutiny required to enter the public markets. Um, sorry, I broke up a little bit. There's mad scrutiny required to enter the public markets. You got to deal with bankers. You got to deal with solvency requirements and so on. And so, you know, <laughs> true to capitalists, they created some shell company that can acquire a company that's trying to go public. Effectively, uh, 
they take the shell company public and then the company that they acquire goes with them and then it's listable on the IPO and you bypass the, the speculation, voila. Um, so anyway, with the SPACs, a lot of companies have gone public. One thing I've noticed though, is that these, this record wave of liquidity that these IPOs create, all these investors that got in all the way throughout the private trajectory of the company made a ton of bread. They all got rich. Early employees, rich. Founders, rich. VCs, rich. Growth stage equity, rich. Um, and the multiples get smaller the bigger you are, but they write bigger checks. So the angel only needs to write 25K for it to pop off and for them to make a fortune. But if you're invested in the growth stage equity, you write a $50 million check and you might get a 3X. And guess what? when you form a cap table, right? I'm a founder, I'm at the beginning of loop. Then come my seed investors, then come the series A investors. And this is what's called the cap capital stack, the cap stack. And then every investor on top of the stack, they have their preferences. So they get what's called a liquidation preference. So when, when money pops off in the, in the exit, later in stage, whoop, they go first. And then everyone goes, 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 goes. And then the founders get paid. So anyway, all that to say that, uh, I want to encourage also people of color out there. You don't need money to get started, but get good enough that you can fucking raise money. Mm. Get good enough. Know your shit cold, cold. Tell your story, package it up, get some fucking swag, right? Make terms up, make terms up. I'm serious. Yeah. Take your business and just imagine a fucking term and say, you know what EYL is? The biggest show on fucking earth, right? Like you guys, made that up, <laughs> brought it out. People, you know, and, and, and that storytelling. So founders out there is so, please, it is so much less science. The information is out there, consume it and fucking learn it, but it's cost of entry. After that is swag, is salesmanship, is vision, is creativity, is motivating people. You gotta get them excited. You have to reorganize the ingredients that are already there to make a little bit of a different outcome. That's what entrepreneurship is. Stop trying to over prescribe it. You know, we got that in the culture already. You're going to tell me that a bunch of these white cats with no swag are out there getting the bulk of the bag. Come on, man. Like get sharp. So that never becomes a bottleneck. Get sharp laser fucking razor. And then they can never deny you all merit. And then we have the swag on top. <laughs> so, yeah. so you don't need it, but get good enough that you can get it. And then we go told the, the, the swag is sold separately. That's something that didn't. <laughs> swag is so like separate. That, I like that. Hey, John, swag we got to get you a know your, know your shit shirt. I like that. That's your phrase, bro. You got to you gotta, you gotta know that shit, Cole. All right, hey, can I, can I go to one? Um, let's go to Zoom. Well, we got, all right, let's see. Anthony, we got, I'm coming to you. Um, mute yourself. You've been unmuted. Uh, go ahead. What's going on, Anthony? Can you hear me, my brother? Yeah, we hear you perfectly. Yeah, yeah. What's going on? All good, man. I just met you brothers on Tuesday, man. It was real good, uh, a, a real good energy up at the LA little mixer situation, man. I appreciate y'all. Oh, yeah, yeah. Speak, speak, speak about that. If anybody's not familiar, we had a private networking event for EYL University in LA, and um, everybody showed up. Him 500, Alice Good Energy, Shiggy. Um, Mike Rasheed, Tia Blair, Tia Blair, it's business, it's business. It was a whole vibe. So how'd you how'd you enjoy it? Oh yeah, a Anthony Walker was in the building too, so that was a major situation. <laughs> hey, the, how can, <laughs> the most important. We were yeah. getting there. <laughs> yeah, but but I I enjoyed it. Like I really did enjoy it. I, I think that you guys um, just created a whole nother. Like I think post COVID, it's a whole nother thing that's gonna be able to happen for y'all. You know what I'm saying? Where you're gonna really get a chance to touch the people, man, that's the most important thing, I think. And that's where you build that deep value. You know what I'm saying? You build deep, you know, go going, y'all going deep. And I see that. So I appreciate y'all for that, man. It's a real beautiful play. Um, you. Appreciate, love love. appreciate you. Yes, sir. But my, my question, man, is for both of you, uh, or both, you know, both, all three of y'all. But uh, so both of your businesses are, have a subscription based model to it. You know what I'm saying? And that's a real interesting business model. And to me, it seems like the best business model going forward. But can you guys just talk to me why that is um, and or compare that to other business models that, um, you know what I'm saying, that you either see that are popular or that that, that might be uh, strong going forward? 
Yeah, for sure. Um, so, I mean, for us, we have a couple of different business models. So we have some products like merch. By the way, the merch, we have a 50% off of our merch for all winter. Ooh. Yeah, so E-Y-L-U 50, uh, and you get 50% off of all merch. Uh, that's winter. Yeah, speaking of. Perfect segue. <laughs> well, yeah, we have we have items like merch, which is one off. That's not, obviously that's not a subscription. Um, but yeah, EYL University, cause that's a recurring thing. So it's like a never ending story where that's something that we constantly do. It's like a, it's, it's school. So it's just like you go to, you know, college, you go to freshman year, sophomore year, junior year. So for us, I mean, we, we do both ways as far as like, if we do an event, that'll be a one-off. If we do merch, that'll be a one-off. Um, if we write a book, that's a one-off, but, um, EYL University, that's like an ongoing subscription. So I think both ways can work, but um, of course the subscription is always good because it's reoccurring. Um, and as long as you can continue to add value, then people will continue to, to pay. That's what business is all about, right? People pay for value. So mm -hmm. it's like you pay $9.99 or whatever it is for Netflix every single month. Um, and as long as you're satisfied with what, what, ne what Netflix is providing you, Fair you're going enough. to you're going to continue to pay it. If right. for whatever you become dissatisfied at the service that Netflix is providing, you're going to cut the cord and cancel your service. So yeah. I think it's the, it's the same, no matter what it is, whether it's car insurance, whether it's education, whether it's entertainment. Um, if you can consistently add value um, on an ongoing basis, mm -hmm. then the, the business model is there for that. And like I said, the good thing with subscription-based services or subscription-based business models is that you can do it in all different things. You can do it in makeup and where they get like packages in the mail every month. You can do um, fitness where that's what, you know, if you go to a gym, right. Or if you online, you know, you're paying whatever the, the, the fee is every single month. So um, yeah, it's, it's a way to, to build a, a book of business. Yeah. And really at that point in time, your main focus as a business owner is just to provide as much value as possible yeah. to your community. So me, like I used to be, I'm still in the financial services world. So one of the things, like if you, if you're making a living off of commission, like a life insurance product or whatever, the thing about it is that you might have a good sale, you make some money, but now you start back at zero. So now you got to go back out and, and do it all over again. Whereas if you, if you have a subscription model or if you're getting paid um, annual revenue that comes in, you can focus more attention on your actual clients and actually just making the experience as good as possible for them um, because new people come into the fold, but mm -hmm. your whole focus isn't on just attracting new people. It's actually just building and broadening. So that's why we did the free networking event in LA. And that's why we're going to do one in Atlanta. Cause it's like, we just always just constantly just try to add as much value as we possibly can. So that's another value that I think, you know, business owners have is, is less pressure to, to try to get new people. You can continue just to add value to the community as much as you possibly can. Yeah, thanks, man. I was going to say that part, but like it, it, it goes back to the first question, right? How do we build something that's scalable? And the first thing I said was value, right? And so as a creative and as a business owner, having a subscription service allows you to add, and that's the thing. Like there's so many creative ways to add to the community. And when you add it, then obviously people are gonna wanna say, because it's like, wait, we didn't have that last month. This is something new. And so the way you can keep it fresh is, is no difference, right? It's no difference from uh, Disney Plus saying, we're gonna add uh, a new show to the network. You can't wait for that show to come because now it's like, wait, we had all this and now you're adding something new to the, the, the process. So yeah, exactly what Shadi said, adding, it, it makes, of the business more creative because now I have to think of like what's new, what's fresh, how do we keep this thing fresh? So it keeps us on our toes. It's like, all right, well, we've had this for the public, but we have new people coming in and we have some people who've been here with us for a while. Let's keep it fresh, let's keep it new, let's keep it funky. And so now the community grows because it's like, this is the best, best place to be. Go ahead, John. That's interesting, Troy. I never thought about it from, from that perspective. Like subscription hat keeps you guys like innovating pretty much. Uh, so I never thought about it as a driver for for mixing shit up and Anthony, I want to say it's a good, it's a great question. And one of the real based revenues is uh, of course, predictability, um, but also you're able to forecast and in business, there's a lot of value to being able to forecast and extrapolate outward into the future. And once you've been growing your subscription base for long enough, 
you can also assume a rate of growth, right? So if you're at a thousand, if you start at 50, you go up to a hundred, you know, you can look and say, yo, all right, bet. How many people are we growing by every month? And then you can say, all right, assume that growth keeps happening. Um, what's going to be our revenue by year one, let's say. Now you may not hit that. You may su succeed it. You may not. But the point is there's value in being able to forecast. So I like that. But one-off sales allow you to diversify your revenue mix. Um, I was overly concentrated when I had my laundry business. You can be, there's such thing as, a, it's called a concentration risk. So you can have mad money coming from one particular account. And if you lose that account, it'll fucking rattle you, right? So when I started my laundry business, I was cleaning the wardrobe for big movies. I found my way into the Wolf of Wall Street, big movie, um, got that account. And they said, yo, I was 18 years old, man. That's crazy. It's like, yo, uh, law, there's a new account in town. If you get them, you're going to be all right for a while. That was Boardwalk Empire. He said, I'm going to make the introduction. Then it's on you. I was able to finagle it. While you have that account, go and try and sell others. Point is, I had most revenues coming from maybe four accounts and I lost one of them and it fucking rocked us. You know, I didn't have the money that I needed to build off of it. So you can have concentration risk in the amount of customers that you have your revenue coming from. You can also have concentration risk in having all of your money coming from one particular line of business in the overall, like call it umbrella company. So I like the fact that, for example, EYL is diverse. You got, you got some merch. It's quicker hit. It's more voluminous. So you drive volume. And here's the cool thing. You can sell your one-off products right? That's the $1 burger. And then McDonald's makes some monies on the fries and, and the shake, right? So you need a little bit of a loss leader product that's low cost and even potentially low margin for you. You may not even make money on it, but you get them into your ethos and then you can pass off the subscription service after they've consumed some content for you. Say, yo, I fuck with these guys. Boom. Then, they, then you have the sub. So um, you're thinking the right way, but also don't forget to you know, incorporate different things in your business that can make the whole machine work because you kind of need a system. Yeah, John, you said something that was really important. And I, I, I actually just thought of it, especially when you're doing a subscription model, there's something called the rate of retention. And so when you see the rate of retention, you can see based on when somebody joined until when they hopefully never left, but it tells you what's been working for the, the company. And mm -hmm. you can see what, you know I mean, what content worked, uh, was there a sale that worked? And so you get all those data points. Whereas if somebody comes and they go, it's like, all right, they supported us one month. What happened to that person? Right, all right, right. So it gives you like an inventory based on your business of strategies and assessments of, all right, that worked for us. We can continue doing that. That's another good uh, thing to, to keep in mind. Oh, shit. Yo, Anthony, appreciate you, bro. All right. I'm going to go to Darlene because she's saying she doesn't know how to talk. Darlene, you've been permitted. What's going on? Oh, got to learn. <laughs> it's our first time, I think. Hello. Oh, Darlene, there you there are. You that, that's how you oh do it. Oh, my gosh. Yay. Thank you. I'm so <laughs> glad it worked. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you all for this session. Um, I'm just loving every minute of it. I uh, It's very timely, too, because I am entertaining my first um, opportunity to join as a limited partner in mm. a, a, a venture capital raise. Um, and of course, there's lots of nerves that go into that in terms of what my process should be to evaluate whether or not this is worth my capital um, and to evaluate the sponsor versus the project. And I, I, I wonder if you might be able to just give me some nuts and bolts as a potential limited partner of what I should be looking for. Please. Beautiful question. I'm really glad you joined. And also, by the way, I don't want to breeze past that you're even in a position where you people can come up to you and ask you for investment and you can reasonably consider the option. So kudos, because that means that you, you. a little bread set aside and that you now have the opportunity. And that's what I think people miss is like just having the opportunity to, to go in or pass is, you know, really what our community should be striving for. So, um, Additional questions, Clarity. When you say LP in a venture capital raise, is are you evaluating investing directly in a startup, or are you evaluating investing in a fund? 
or you, towards the end you had said sponsor and projects and that's terminology that's more commonly used in real estate projects like development projects so are you might might you also be referring to a, a real estate project can you describe a little bit well i'm i'm actually i'm i'm choosing between two opportunities okay one is a um a fund event a, a, a fund in um for ca a cannabis business Copy. and one is a syndication a real estate syndication there you go got it um so the real estate syndication i'm more comfortable with okay. um because it's it just seems more straightforward you know you look at your sponsor and all of that it's a more the the venture capital fund for the uh, the cannabis business that i'm a little bit not sure how to assess <laughs> got you got you. do you have any do you have any real estate deals yet or do you have any deals of any kind yet um like syndications yeah anything you um you got stocks you got real estate that you own on your own oh yeah so i i have um some stocks i have two rental properties oh, okay, okay um and so this would be kind of my first deal that's not something that i'm directly doing got you got you okay bet so now i have the info wow congrats again sis you have set yourself up um and and i know that comes with tremendous effort and hard work so i really commend you for that thank you eyl they got me on fire since last year this is Let's all go. new this is uh, all new these that's... brothers are doing it for us they're that's getting us real. on fire so i'm gonna give you your kudos Information on us, applications on you. I appreciate that. Right. <laughs> Thank Yo, you. So check this out. So now this is wonderful because that context was really helpful because the answer changes depending on your situation, right? Like, like if you, if you just got a little bit of bread, then investing in a syndication or in a, in a VC fund is mad risky and not the best building block, but you've gone and built the building blocks of securities that are publicly traded, that are highly liquid. You can exchange them at any time for cash. And then you have some illiquid assets that can hedge against the market. Its volatility is providing you now with straight cash flow. And it's kind of good that it's not liquid because um, illiquid assets have less volatility. So now you have an attractive portfolio construction. And now you have the opportunity as a third rung, right? So first rung secure, next one Ill illiquid, but also secure. And now this third rung, you can start considering some riskier um, situations, some situations where you're not in control, you're an LP to the viewer out there, a limited partner. Limited partner, why? Because you're a partner in the deal. However, your risk is exposed. Your risk is really only what you've put into the deal. So you can only lose what you've put up. Cool. However, typically when you're an LP, you don't, you're indemnified from any operational risks. So that, that business goes bankrupt, that business gets sued, any of that is on the GP, the general partner who is out there helming up the deal. You just lose your money and you're all good. Now, similarly, that doesn't sound good to me. <laughs> doesn't sound good. So I started with right. the bad part, but now, right. Similarly. Um, and by the way, so, some people might like that you can lose your bread, but if you only put 25 racks, cool, you're out 25 racks, but that was the risk that you took. And of course it'll be a well-calculated bet. Now the, the, one of the other sides as well is you have participation rights um, but not, you know, any voting interests. Sometimes LPs can negotiate for, depending on the power of the LP and the powers associated to the check size, sometimes LPs can negotiate for voting interests on major liquidation events. For example, M&A. If someone's looking to buy or sell the actual asset or the business or whatever, then it's subject to a majority vote from the LP base. Now, more commonly, you only have participation rights. You put money in, the sponsor is looking to guarantee, or not guarantee, but um, suggests that you're going to have a fixed return, 8%, right? Okay, cool. So now I've explained the LP structure. Now we evaluate the two deals. You're, you're considering between real estate and the cannabis fund that's more VC. By the way, Darlene, there is a reason why you feel more uncomfortable with the VC one, <laughs> because it's a lot riskier. Right. And there's a reason why you was like, OK, cool. Like real estate, I kind of felt like I get, you know, I'm already in this field. And that level of discomfort to comfort ratio is directly reciprocal to your returns opportunity as well. Right. Yeah. So if, in you know terms saying, of returns too, they so the real estate, I don't really know how to understand this. Right. The internal rate of return, the IRR for the real estate one, they say is like 14 percent. 
and the internal rate of return okay. for the cannabis one they're saying is like 40 to 50 percent is right, that related right. to the risk of it correct because the internal rate of return uh, which is a little bit more of an elusive metric but it is effectively um your it's like a cash on cash return right but when you use the cash on cash return in, in real estate, i.e. I invested hundred grand, I got 25K back that one year, that's a 25K cash on cash. But what cash on cash does not capture is any appreciation, um, any, any and all of the financial benefits other than just dividends. So the IRR is a more expansive, comprehensive metric. And that is 100% correlated to risk. So just to keep it simple, right? In real estate, you stand to make less because the risk is less. There's a tangible asset in the case that some shit goes wrong. You can always just sell the bones. You can sell the building, recoup some capital, and your downside is exposed. In a venture capital fund, those deals can pop off. Those deals, if you get, if that fund manager is fortunate enough to get into a business like a Coinbase, for example, they hit 100 billion IPO, best return in all private capital, everyone's rich, right? Now, you're going to get into a lot more zeros than you are rock stars. But the reason I like a fund personally, as if I were you as an LP, is because a fund, their risk is spread across an aggregate of numerous companies. If you were making an investment in a directly in a startup, I would personally you know, dissuade you from it unless you had startup experience. But investing in a fund manager, I just made an investment in a fund myself last week. Um, not a whole lot. You know, I threw them. I threw him, you know, some bread and I said, yo, hold that down. Why did I do that? Right. I evaluate the same opportunity as you, not, not the same exact one, but the same type because I realized, okay, I like, they're good pickers. I trust these people. Like they got an eye for startups. They're always in the mix. People know them. I just felt like, all right, bet. I'm going to give you whatever you can expect your money to triple effectively two to three X over 10 years. You can also expect ironically, similar returns from venture over the same time period and venture is a little bit less risky. So that said, um, I think that um, I personally would go with the individuals that you felt the most comfortable with, irrespective of the actual vehicle itself. That is my okay. personal opinion. A lot of times this game comes down to the team behind it. And this is when, you know, VCs always say team, 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 but you brought up a perfect case scenario where it makes sense. You're evaluating two potential projects. They're in two potential fields, right? Both can work, both can fail, whatever. Which is the set of individuals that kind of makes you feel the most comfortable when you talk to them? You kind of feel like the integrity is tight. You feel like they get back to you in a timely manner. You feel a little bit more, you know, whomever that team is, if I were in your shoes, I tend to lean on the side of, yo, I kind of just fucks with them the most. Let me put my money here and watch it play out as long as you can afford to lose it. Um, you know, that's of course always a risk, but that's kind of is my read on the situation. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you, Darlene. Thank, thank you. Thanks, John. Bye. Yo, of course, of course, Darlene. Wow. And dang, I, I went long on that, but I rarely get to discuss like the fucking mechanics. So if I, <laughs> that's, that's I saw you, was, you were your passion just now. Nah, man, you gotta, you gotta, you know, that's John Henry, man. Like, you know, that's something that's extremely valuable information to have somebody that not just in theory, um, started a venture capital fund, um, was extremely successful in venture capital, trans, trans, transformed that to what he's doing now, as far as started an insurance company. Um, you know, Forbes 30 under 30, like this is a very rare opportunity to have, you know, an opportunity to ask somebody like that, you know, a personal question and have them answer it for you in a very detailed manner. So, you know, that's, that's, that's something that's not, that's not normal. Appreciate you. And uh, Darlene, hope that helps. Good luck. Keep us posted, by the way. Let us know. Let us know. Slide in the EYL comments or my comments in one of these days and let us know where, where you shook out. Yes, yes. Emmanuel, we coming to you. Unmute yourself. You've been unmuted. What's going on? Appreciate you guys. I got lucky. Second night in a row. I'm in here. I'm rocking. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to keep it quick, though, since I got my time yesterday. Um, two questions for you, John. If you had to take somebody that was newer to entrepreneurship, I have an LLC, haven't really done anything with it. I wanted to do like an IT consulting company, but a lot of people in my community don't really have that drive behind them to learn that. 
So what are some good businesses um, to start off that'll give you like a, a nice stable foundation or like a stable return that somebody can kind of learn from the jump and grow with? Copy, copy. I'm sorry, are those both questions rolled up in one or is the other one completely? My other question was what, what type of information can I start reading to get a foundation for how to really go about creating a business structure? Got it. Got it. Yeah. We'd love the EYL boys a uh, uh, toss on this. In my, in my view, like cert, honestly, service-based shit is not super scalable, but um, there's always a, a clientele for it. So if you're coming from IT, you know, like I think I reflect back to my earliest, earliest days when I was dry cleaning, like that's a service, man. I didn't, I didn't create a product. I didn't know how to do that shit. I didn't know anything about, I didn't know a lot about most things, but I figure I could definitely convince you um, to use me, right? Like you were already using dry cleaning. I didn't have to convince you on a product that was novel. I just had to convince you to go with me. Got and it. so, you know, that service-based approach allows you to develop some revenue. It is going to be, of course, tied to your time. And that's the, that's the uh, bad part about it. However, um, that was my bridge away from a W2 world that I didn't want to be in. It was like, all right, bet. let me at least, if I could work for eight hours for someone else, I could definitely sell for eight hours for myself. Right. And just eat what I kill. And I was like, yo, I'm making 500 bucks a week. Like, you mean to tell me I can't figure out a way to make 500 bucks a week? Like, yeah. that was all the money in the world to me. Um, however, I was like, yo, let me, I, I think I can make 500 bucks somehow. Um, and that's what kind of bridged me over. So that's my take. Um, of course, there's a lot of other takes. And EYL is constantly in the flow of, uh, you know, different businesses that are generating revenue. So would love your guys' take as well. Yeah, so... The question was how to create revenue. Model? Like some, some like the best businesses for like somewhat predictable revenue in the beginning. Like for a first time business owner, if you were to get in something, if you were to put your hand in somewhere and start off from something, what, what would be some of the businesses that would be most stable and sustainable for me? Um, oh, I think you gotta look at service-based businesses that, you know, there's always needs for, um, but also, I will look at things that are low cost items to start. Mm -hmm. um, this is why that Amazon situation is so, so popular because it's like, you know, very low cost and you can sell things that people really need. But um, I would, I would kind of look for something. I mean, that's, that's kind of a tough question because it's hard to really give advice on something that you haven't done to be completely honest with you about it. And oh, um, I, you know, we're a media company and it's worked for us. Now, obviously that's not something that will work for everybody, yeah. right? Like I can tell you that, okay, well, probably if you open a nail salon, be great. Pe people are always gonna get their nails done, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. I don't, I've, nev I've never, I've, <laughs> I don't, I've never opened a nail salon. Yeah. So I can't, you know, I can, it, it makes sense to me because it's a recession proof business. It's something that, you know, outside of the pandemic um, is never going away. A barbershop is never going away. People always need their hair cut, True. but, um, yeah. They think there's limited upside on that. But I think for me personally, I just like to give advice on things that we have really experienced or we know closely firsthand. And most of those yep. things aren't in that field. Like even the people that we have relationships with, um, they're not, it's not directly in that field as far as like with the nail salon, the mm -hmm. barbershops, things of that nature. Yeah. So yeah. You, you have yeah I, I would just add to it um i think the word deviation is the word right well, we didn't we didn't we didn't have to deviate from what we were already rooted in and so shadi's career was already in financial advising i was already in education we just figured out there was something that we can do based on what we already knew and so doing other things like we could have opened a barbershop or we we could have now that mm -hmm. we do trucking right we, we learned those things but our root our core like people call it the mother our mothership is what we have already been doing. And so a lot of times people, especially in education, and that's, you know, that's my background, so that's where I could speak from, it was, okay, we're gonna try a bunch of things until something works based in what we already are rooted in. And so earn mm -hmm. your leisure becomes an extension of really education from in a financial sense. And so like, I, I wouldn't, I would find what I'm doing now because a lot of people discount that, right? There's something that you're doing right now that you're super skilled at, that you're overlooking because you want to try to create a business from something you know nothing about. And we do that and it's okay, but you have a skill right now. Yeah, yeah, I think you're going about it the wrong way as far as to see 
what's the, the path of least resistance or what's the easiest way to kind of have a safe play. Nothing is ever safe in business. There's always obstacles and the vast majority of businesses don't succeed. That's fine because you can start another business, but um, I would chase your passion first. I would see what you're already doing, how you can monetize that, where you have relationships, what you enjoy, um, where you think you can help people. It sounds mm -hmm. corny, yeah. but I think that that's something that, you know, <laughs> we have, um, that's, that's, what, that's really the core root of our business. It's right. like to say, okay, this is something that before we can make money, we can help people. And I think that as long as you can help people, you're always gonna be able to make money. So if I was starting a business, I would start with something that I'm passionate about, something that, something that can help people, something that I'm already doing, something that I know. I wouldn't necessarily start with something that I have no idea about, but I think it is something that is pe what people, you know, would be an easy situation to yeah. do. I'm telling you, like, that's no joke. Like when True. I was teaching, I was a coach, right? <laughs> I was a, a after school program coordinator. I did everything I could in education as another source of income, right? I was a tutor, right? Anything I could find income from what I was already doing, I was trying to do. Creating mm -hmm. programs based around education. All right, let's do that too. Earn your so leisure. What you're saying is basically stay in my lane. <laughs> nah, yeah, I mean, it's right. a million lanes. Everybody has to get in one, but, but just hone, hone, hone it, hone it. Hone down on what you, on what you're already doing or what you are passionate about. And I would, I would pursue that first. Got it. There's a lot of depth there, man. I, th I think it's sound advice. Um, so hopefully this helps you. And, and by the way, sometimes you got to do a lot of, you, sometimes you just got to try a lot of shit that you find out later you don't like until you figure out what you do like. That's um, where I'm at. So just that, give yourself <laughs> the space, man. give yourself permission to just, um, you know, go through every emotion while you, while you find what to lock in on. But the, the greatest blessing is to have something that you feel worthy of locking in on. Once you find that thing that you could lock in on and just pour your all into it, especially if you, you know, whether that's by yourself or with friends or whatever, it's a very special thing. Uh, and, and that, um, that is the best we can ask for pretty much. So I wish you success and I wish you luck uh, on your journey to find that. Let us know. Keep us posted. Absolutely. Appreciate it. The more people you can help, the more money you can make. If you really think about it, every successful business Back. that they've helped people, even if you look at the richest people in the world, if you look at, um, you know, Amazon, right? At its core root, it's helping people. It's helping people, um, making shopping a lot easier. And mm -hmm, it started so. with books and now it's everything e-commerce where it's like, now you don't have to go to Target or Walmart. You can choose from the convenience of your home and they've cut out their competition, it's cheaper prices. So regardless if you, if you agree with their business model or not, it's built around providing a service that's valuable for people to help people. Yeah. So Netflix, the same way, it helps people entertain, soothe, get over, you know, you don't have to go to the movies. That was the whole thing, right? It was like, you don't even have to go to Blockbuster. Like at least Done. before you had to actually drive to Blockbuster, they realized that people would rather just stay at home. And instead of paying $9.99 for a cassette for at three Blockbuster, days. you could pay $9.99 a month and have unlimited movies that you can watch at your disposal. So yeah. the, the, the quicker people figure that out, I think the better off everybody will be in business. And like I said, um, it sounds cheesy, but it, yeah. it is true. The more people that you can help, the more money you can make. That's it. That's it. So chase your passion, find a problem, try to create a solution for it. Help people. Yes. That was my, John, luck, Henry. That was my John Henry moment right there. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. Right, let's go to Angel. Angel, what's going on? Unmute yourself. You've been unmuted. Hey, fellas. How's it going? Everything's great. How are you? Good, good, good. Uh, Angel Garcia down here, Little Havana. I got a question for both of you guys. Uh, I'm in the real estate business and uh, I've been in the business now for about 15 years. I have a master's degree. I've worked for a couple private equity firms in town and I've gone to the point and I've gone to a skill level where, you know, I just really want to start doing this for myself. And my goal is to become a developer. And as you guys probably know, there aren't a lot of Latino developers. There aren't a lot of black developers. Every time I'm in a room, it's usually with people that don't look like me. So I have the skill level. I have the ability. I have the experience. Now what I really need is to figure out how to raise the capital I need, whether it's on the GP side or the LP side, to fund these projects that I know how to manage 
that I know how to turn a profit on. And there's like a gap where I have the skill and experience, but I don't have the partners and I don't have the capital to get started. But I have the skills, I have the experience, I just need to fill that gap. So whether it's going to seminars to meet like-minded people, I'm just trying to figure out how to launch here to take advantage of this skill set and really make it, you know, and um, really make a dent in the real estate business. Got it. Got it. Cool. Cool. Awesome, man. Congratulations on being in that position. Um, I think, you know, few, few of us Latinos and um, black folks are um, get the opportunity to have gone through the, through, you know, I'm sure it was a lot of hard work and somehow through that hard work, you've now developed your technical acumen, your expertise, and you are able, my friend, to craft more novel projects that are more difficult to put together. They're more complex and they're typically at larger scale um, because, you know, unlike someone who's buying and flipping homes, which can make a lot of bread and you make a lot of cash on cash return on small deals, that's it's really going to be really hard to flip your way up to the point where you're doing four or 500 unit deals, megaplexes and really doing large developments and a flipper can get there. Um, but the bridge from there to there is the technical acumen that you've acquired and you've learned to shave on someone else's face, <laughs> right? So right. you got the chops while being paid a nice, comfortable salary. And I bet you made bonuses along the way. So now you have probably a little bit of a cash cushion. You're, you're, um, and, and you're pursuing how to get started. You want to crack it. This is my exact story. Uh, although, uh, probably more true of my partners, right? So I, I'm more of just like a raw hustler, just taught myself this shit somehow. My partners right. were a lot, more, my, my former partners at Harlem Capital were in a lot more in your position where they had gone through dun, 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 and we knew we wanted to do it for ourselves. So the best thing that I can tell you is um, one, do it with homies. If you end up doing it with anyone, do it with homies, man. The solo GP path is brutal, is lonely, it's kind of whack. You can't super. Yeah, I definitely don't want to do that. I mean, it's just too much work Two, do it with your own money to start. If you can, even if it's on a small scale, because the biggest path of resistance that you will get on any fundraising trail when you're a first time fund manager will always be, well, what's your track record? Now you can point to your track record of your body of work from your private equity funds, but everyone knows that, you know, being an analyst and being an associate at a firm don't mean that you source the deal. Don't mean that you cut the deal. Don't mean that you, you know, orchestrated the deal. You just worked on it, but analysts get the most chops because you're out there doing the dirty work and and doing the heavy lifting. So you, you can point to your past body of work as a way to demonstrate that you have the technical acumen and the modeling experience to be able to um, properly uh, handle that side of the deal. And you just got to prove that you have that beast in you that can go out there and get deals, close deals, look a man straight in the fucking eye or woman, shake their hands and get the deal done. Right. And, and it I'll doesn't matter that. what the, I've the scale done is, that. right? I've actually You've done, done that. that. Great. So yeah. now, so, so then I, if I were you, there really wouldn't be a question that you would have to ask, right? You got to mm-hmm. nat- you, you tap that fucking inner shark, right? Like you got the deal, you got the technical acumen. And now you, what you have to work on is packaging, right? Packaging the deck, my friend is the biggest tool in raising money, any asset class period. Right. You put together a deck and you will have mo- that's that's a killer deck and you can sell it and you will have money on the other side. To me, it's always been bizarre, by the way, that right. you can walk in there with a fucking PowerPoint and present it and just sell someone. And on the other side of that, you will get a, 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 a check uh, on the other side of a diligence process, of course. So, um, uh, of course, this is in some essences a simplification, but in other essences, the only information that I believe um you really need is put it together and over index on the side of making it look professional. For example, we actually, we paid someone like 1500 bucks or $2,000 to put together. uh, You know, I made my own deck and then I had someone else design it, make it look killer. And it's like, yeah, that's a lot of money to spend on a deck, but I'm going to spend two grand on a doc. That's going to make me 20 million. Yeah. It's worth over index on the materials looking good over index on, you know, um, on just having a, a tight thesis and, and knowing your shit. And, um, and I don't think that there's any reason why you couldn't go out there. And by the way, there's a lot of diversity money going to emerging fund managers right now. Diverse. 
Um, they don't so have this- enough back. There's only fucking Don Peoples and all these other guys. So if an Angel Garcia comes along and he knows his shit and he's sharp and you know he can sell, then you're going to get the bag, guaranteed. Uh, where can I find that link, though, I guess, is my question. What, what link, bro? Like, like, who, like, who are those funds that I can have the conversation with? I mean, it's out there, but I just don't know where to go, I guess is. I mean, they're not in a neat little list that says, yo, come find me. <laughs> right. You know, it's elusive. It's, you know, capital's in the fucking air right now. You know, right. trillions right. of dollars always flowing. You know, if you make yeah. a good impression, I might be able to know someone who does consider LP deals. And then you get to them. And then that person probably knows a few other people. And you got to work your way in with salesmanship and alert, you know, and that alert. Um, yeah. So, for example, I would, I would, for example I would, so I'll do, I'll do this. I'll do this for the community out there. Put together some materials and send them my way. If I like them, I will put them in front of a number of dudes that I know whose uh, net worth is in 20, 50 M's, whom consider these investments regularly, that might take a, 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 a serious look if I send it their way. But you got to have your shit together. And if it's not, I will simply not pass it on because I, I treasure these relationships too much. But if they are, I give you my word that I will do request a double opt intro and say, yo, take a look at this. Is this, do you want to learn more? And if they say, yes, this, you know, that's kind of on you and the timing and everything else, but um, you got to hustle your way in. So let's see what you can produce. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. I yeah. appreciate that. You have I'll it. make sure uh, to do that. Also, I always say shout out to Angel. I remember him from the Airbnb episode. He's in um, Little Havana. Um, what, are you Cuban? Um, Puerto Rican and black. Puerto Rican and black. Okay. Mm-hmm. So what, what, another thing that you should, networking is extremely important, right? And um, you said something that was very poignant. You said, um, you know, a lot of, most real estate developers, they're, they're white and it's hard to crack into that situation for a variety of different reasons. We don't even have to go into that, but um, never discount the value of networking and affinity groups. So there's a lot of Puerto Rican people. I don't know about Miami, but I know in Orlando, in Florida, in New York, definitely. Um, I would look for infinity groups, uh, especially on the Latin side, especially on the, you know, Port- it doesn't even have to be Puerto Rican group. It could be a Cuban group too. Um, if you speak Spanish, that's, that's a tremendously valuable thing in America. Um, I would look for affinity groups and network with other Latino or black developers um, and if there aren't any infinity groups in the area, I would start one um, because people tend to be tribal in nature. This is something that is extremely important for people to understand. Um, Jewish people usually tend to do business with Jewish people. Indian people usually tend to do business with Indian people. Uh, Italian people tend to usually do business with Italian people. The problem is that a lot of times it's black and Spanish people, Latin people, we look for other groups to do business with us, unfortunately, because we're not in positions of power. So we look for them to hire us. We look for them to partner with us, but that's not really the best way to go about it because self-preservation is the number one key to life. And like yep. I said, people are naturally tribal by nature. So you, you, you really can't expect white people to do business with you. I mean, <laughs> they can if they want to, but in reality, they, they have more in common with other white people. What we need to do is start doing business with each other. Black people need to start doing business with black people. Italian, um, Spanish people, Latin people need to start doing business with Latin people. We need to start doing business with each other. And that way we wouldn't have to rely on always looking for a white savior to save us because um, that's not gonna happen, to yeah. be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. Angel, I, 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 got, I got advice that you can apply like right now. Okay. You can go to the Facebook group right now, tell them everything that you're talking about. And I guarantee there will be some earners that'll be interested to help you and be a part of what you're trying to do. Like you have a network of people that you're on Zoom right now. So I know you're an earner. And so if you right. tell the people the intent, it's an amazing community. I'm not just saying it because we're part, like I've seen it happen. I've seen people. It's the reason why we have our own groups inside of EYL University is for these exact reasons. Who are the people I can partner with? I'm sure there's plenty of people in South Florida that are inside the group right now that are, didn't even know that this was happening, right? That you had these ambitions and will be willing to work with you and help you in this process. You can do that like 
Oh, well, after this is done, don't do it right now. <laughs> right. I'll make sure to do that. Absolutely, man. And we'll be able to see it too. So, so uh, I'm looking forward to putting, seeing you putting that message in, in, the, in the group. Okay. I'll make sure to do that. Thank you. Appreciate you, Angel. Angel, good luck, man. Um, uh, be encouraged, my friend. I think you, you have a really unique opportunity ahead of you. Um, you have all the, the wherewithal and the knowledge, and it's going to be purely a measure of your effort and resourcefulness from this point. So Godspeed, my friend, and keep us posted. Oh, we got this is this is a special calling right here. Andre Hatchet. Yo, um, also, also oh, a yeah. quick note um, to the to the 1.1 thousand of you guys watching. Thank you so much for tuning in to uh, the Wealth Principles. Uh, it's been a, a, an, ex, an experimental collaboration between uh, Loop and myself and Earn Your Leisure team. So uh, we man, we we're proud of the value that we delivered. We've dived into how the mechanics of how to build a $250 million company with, with, with one of the only black founders, speaking of black business, that has gone and done that, Saint Laurent. We've talked about content strategy in great depth from the team captain of Gary V, who uh, is probably the best modern marketer in the world at the moment. Um, and we've also discussed the power of brand with one of my favorite up and coming entrepreneurs that I consider a close friend as well named Ani Hustles from Kolkata Chaiko. So we've given you a wide variety of information in great detail and mad PDFs, information, you name it all out the wazoo. So I appreciate you guys. If you've gotten any value from this whatsoever, I would appreciate you guys checking out loopinsure.co. That's the name of my company speaking about community support and community man, we, we, we're looking to build an insurance carrier that's for us, by us. Um, none of these other carriers are going to consider our, our, our outcomes, our situations, none of that. And so speaking of what Shadi was saying earlier about adding value, the truth of adding value is you can only add value to the extent um, of what you know, right? And so when I started, I did what I knew because my pops was a dry cleaner. So I, you know, I did that. And then my, as my vision um, it had expanded and my acumen had expanded, I went and did more and more things that helped more and more people. Now I'm at the point in my chops where, you know, I can create a vertically integrated financial services company and attack an industry. I learned how to sell doing dry cleaning. I learned how to brand doing an incubator. I learned how to raise capital starting a fund. This is a combination of all those things paired with, you know, my co-founder who brings a tremendous, this tremendous technical expertise. So we can build, you know, predictive models and ingest data and build mobile product and then apply a brand around it and then apply it to a segment in the market, which is you all community that has been overlooked um, in many different ways. And insurance is, is one is, is certainly a, a, one of the big culprits. So that's what loop is, is our interpretation of how to tackle this from the ground up. Uh, we recently we were this close to, to inking up a, a sizable deal that I hope to be able to announce in, in the coming weeks. Um, and we are not live in the market just yet. We are starting in Texas. Texas was strategically chosen because it's a large market, real voluminous, big auto market. A lot of, lot of us here as well. Austin, Dallas, Houston, El Paso, we're, you know, we're getting busy. But then immediately, you know, we're, this is a venture pace. This is not we're going to be in Texas for three years and then state number two in, in the fourth year. This is we're going to be live in Texas. We're immediately filing our race and filing for, for approval in Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York. Georgia, fucking Atlanta is going to be a key market for us. I'm definitely heading, heading over, you know, Georgia, Arizona. What's good? We're, we're growing, going to expand our geographic footprint. We hope to raise more capital and bring this service to more places. So if that has brought you any ounce of value, head over to loopinsure.co and join the waitlist, man. That would mean a lot to me. Bonus, bonus. If you head over to loopinsure.co slash EYL, that's the uh, web experience that we created in conjunction with UIL that takes a, all the information that was discussed on all these uh, episodes and delivers it to you, no charge, just to build depth, connection, trust. Um, so that's available for you as well. All, also, take note, by the way, just to be transparent about the, the, the page here, right? We're building something for the community. Earn Your Leisure has a uh, platform and uh, enormous currency with the community. So what did we do? We came together and we made a limited series exploration of what could occur um, to cross pollinate and explore the value that could be had there. So also take a page from our book, by the way, if you're a media company, find a partner. And if you're uh, a business, find a media partner. Um, so what we're doing, we're real transparent about it is for you all to, to consume and, and benefit from. 
Um, join that way list. I would really appreciate it. Loopinsure.co. Maybe the boys can link it up. That would be appreciated if it's not already. Sure. Um, and, um, and I think I think somebody put the- John, you there? He froze on our end. I'm not sure if he's frozen on YouTube. Oh, check, 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 check. No, I don't, I don't know if it's, if it's if it's all Wi-Fi or I'm not sure, but you have frozen a little bit. But what I was saying is that also, um, somebody I saw somebody on YouTube saying like, um, we still don't have a Black Wall Street. I would actually beg to differ. Um, we in 2021, so Black Wall Street isn't isn't like a physical place where it's like a town. That's actually limited if you really think about it in today's economy. And I think we actually have and are establishing a Black Wall Street online. And um, when you see Earn Your Leisure, you don't just see a platform, it's an ecosystem of businesses and entrepreneurs that have all come together and all have common goals. So when you see us working with John, um, that's a black owned um, insurance company. You know, that's a black owned, Latin owned insurance company um, that is global, is, will be global. So when you see us working with Alex Good Energy, it's a black owned trucking company. When you see us w- with Paula, who's the only black woman in New York that has a water facility, um, you know, that's extremely important. When you see us with anybody that we have, who 90% of the people that we highlight are black business owners and investors, um, that is a renaissance. That's the new black renaissance. And that is Black Wall Street. Like I said, it's not in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's on, it's on Instagram, it's online. And these people are on all different areas of the, the globe and all different areas of the country. But um, we can't discount the value of the economic renaissance that is actually taking place over the last 18 months. Um, you would be extremely, you would do yourself a disservice if you didn't understand that, like how we looked at Black Wall Street as history. Everything that we're doing right now is going to be looked at as history 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 10 years from now. And it's important that we say that because if not, somebody else will take the credit for what's what's happening and they'll rewrite history however they want it to write it. So if you want to, if you want history to reflect the truth, it's important for you to dictate it and for you to, um, to have a, a deep level of reverence. We always have reverence and respect for people after they die. Unfortunately, people stream DMX music. He's number one. Nipsey Hussle, his music went crazy after he died. But we have to understand that we can't follow dead generals. Like when somebody dies, their legacy, it, there's, there's not a, there's not, you can't follow a dead person. You can look at them for inspiration, but you have to actually have reverence and appreciate people that's actually living. So when I look at John Henry, I look at him as one of the most important entrepreneurs in the, in the, the century. And we have to understand that and not minimize. He started an insurance company. This is Geico. This is his competition, Geico State Farm Nationwide. These are billion dollar industry. So we can't just look at it and just minimize it because he's on YouTube for free for an hour every Thursday this month. We have to understand that this is Black Wall Street and this is history. So just keep that in mind and um, add to it. And let's really grow this as big as it possibly can be. Okay, that's a mindset. That's a mindset. And we are, well, ironically Love. enough, we're, we're approaching the hundredth year of the destruction of, uh, of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. So it, it starts in the mind. And that's why we always, we, we talk about that a lot. When our mindset is there, what we can achieve is, is in, unfathomable. And so we got to remember that. John Henry, oh wait, I, I've had this guy Yo. at home. Let's get hey, Andre, Andre Hatchet. Andre Hatchet. The, the very first, the first EYL professor. university professor. Two, two-time professor. That's true, he did, he, he doubled back. What's going on, Hatchet? Everything is great, man, everything is great. Just called in to just show love to you guys. I've watched every, all four episodes. So I know John from our Harlem days. So shout out to John on the growth and the expansion. Um, honored to know you guys. Okay. Look, look, what up, John? Yo, I'm actually in Austin, John. If you're around, I'd love to get you on my show. Uh, I'll be here till like Saturday, Sunday. So hit me if, if you're down for that. But much I'm love done, to y'all. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. I mean, epic shit happening here. Epic. <laughs> Do pressure. not take it lightly. This is hardcore pressure. <laughs> Do not take it lightly. 
appreciate these brothers. And it's an honor to know you guys. John, hit me up. Uh, EYL. Hopefully we'll be back on the platform sooner than later. Everybody, show these guys some love. All right, y'all. Peace. Yeah, appreciate you, brother. That's love, John. Thank you, man. I mean, Andre. Appreciate Andre, you, man. Andre Hatchett, the king of modal notary business. Another one. That was a shocker. I didn't, Another one. That was, I didn't even know you. that was a business. So. Another one. <laughs> And that's right? his mad high margin. It's insane. I'm like, wait, you made what? Uh, cool, <laughs> man. John, are you ready to just uh, yes. conclude this? Yes, sir. I was just about to say, fellas, it's been real. Um, thank you to everyone who jumped in uh, uh, on this episode. We appreciate you guys getting the chance to jump in, ask questions. I got mad other questions that came in through the emails. that came in through everything. Uh, I thought I would, I would do something fun. Um, um, join, I, I got an idea. I, so I want to invest. I, I mentioned this last time. I've been uh, proactively looking for deals. So I want to invest, as I mentioned, not not a huge amount, but 10, 10 racks. I'll throw 10 racks to a number of businesses that I, I like. Bro, someone was fucking emailing me with all caps lock being like, yo, you really said that shit? And I was like, <laughs> click. And it's like, yo, now that I got your attention, I was like, bro, come on, man. <laughs> I, it's clever, but come on, man. Hit, hit me with some real shit. <laughs> you know, um, if you go, if you go to like, go to join the wait list. And what, what we're going to do is we'll do a clubhouse and, and then we'll just do these live pitches and the deals that I want to double click on. Um, um, we'll, we'll take a look. So just throwing that out there for all the folks that asked questions and didn't and working on businesses and didn't get a chance to, to get their shit answered. We got you, but yo fellas, thank you, man. It's been real. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I learned a great deal uh, from from you guys uh, in you guys, man, you guys it just getting the chance to banter back and forth over the weeks and just seeing your guys is, you know, your, your acumen evolve. The platform has expanded ridiculously from the time we started the show and it was just a month ago. Yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> grown at a ridiculous rate. It's insane, bro. It, like VC bad companies don't grow as fast, bro. I'm, I'm, I watch, bro. I watch hockey, hockey stick, hockey stick growth rate, hockey, hockey stick. stick, bro. Like it's just like this. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, community, take note, man. C continue supporting these brothers. Um, and and then, you know, you guys got the minus touch right now, so keep it rolling. We're gonna be doing everything we can on this side to continue with the uh, to support on the continued growth, man. From sharing episodes, consuming, sharing, everyone do the same. Um, and yeah, man, I think it's been love. It's been a great, it's been a great run. The content's going to live evergreen. We'll see the, the long tail that it ends up having. Um, and it's been a great, honestly, it's been a great, uh, great experience from this side. Yeah. yeah and I appreciate you, bro. Like I said, it's, 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 uh, been a great run for us and we enjoyed it a lot. Um, we look forward to doing more work with you in the future. And it was something that I, I know a lot of people got a lot of value from because I learned and people say like I, I implemented stuff right away when we interviewed, when we did the, the, the content episode and um, Andy, when he was talking about like Insta, um, YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, the, the rails, I forgot what it's called, but YouTube, like it was kind of like a real situation. And yeah, it's YouTube shorts. Yep. YouTube shorts. And I, I did one like an hour after the episode and people were like, are you implementing it already? And I'm like, what's the point of, of listening to something that you're not <laughs> right. going to implement it? And then um, right, with the right. captions, I started putting captions yep. on rails and a couple people noticed that. Like, I see, I see you, um, you didn't waste no time. So yeah, I mean, I'm applying the information myself. And like I said, if you're not, if you're not applying the information then you're just being entertained. Um, so the whole point of it is to provide, is to provide you with information that you can really apply. And these are things that I actually applied in real time, just from, from actually learning from here. So we learn just as much as everybody else learns. So hopefully you guys learn something or a variety of different things that you can implement and make sure you, you rewatch these. They're on YouTube. They're on the podcast, um, channel. So share them. Um, sign up to Loop Insure. Make sure you support that. Make it the number one insurance company in the world. Um, <laughs> let's let's, let's, really, let's really, you know, hit the hit the ball out the park. Yeah, John, always a, a pleasure, man. I called you the young legend, but I'm taking young off. You're just a legend outright. And so um, when you were just speaking, it sparked my brain. I have an idea. They, the people are requesting that you you come back. So I got an idea. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Fellas, be well, man. Enjoy LA. Keep holding it down. We're rooting for you all. And until the next one, fellas.
Peace. All right, bro. Appreciate Peace. you. Thank you all for watching. Listen, appreciate you. Love is love.